Next up is Patrick Harris from Minority Games, the designer of Time Machine VR. So uh, let's give a warm welcome to Patrick. Hooray. Oh. Hello, everybody. This is my little uh, presentation for you called Game Design Unrules, Examining Design Failures in Time Machine VR. And uh, I'm gonna start off with the question on everyone's mind. Uh, who the hell am I? I'm Patrick Harris. I'm the lead designer at Minority Media uh, based out of Montreal, Canada. And I've been the lead designer on Time Machine VR. Uh, if you haven't heard about Time Machine VR, this is my single slide sales pitch. It is a VR only video game. Uh, we actually released on a Steam Early Access about a month ago. Uh, so it's been really cool getting feedback from uh, fans, people playing the game, uh, and we're out there, like people can buy the game. Uh, and the team's been working on it for about a year. So the real question is why do you care what I have to say? I myself have been working in games for about 10 years, so I pretend like I know what I'm talking about. I pretend that I know a few things about best practices when it comes to game design. And this talk is aimed at a very specific kind of person. I'm hoping there's a few of you out there. Uh, this talk is designed at is designed to target guys and gals who have made games before, traditional games, with my little finger quotes there. Traditional games, uh, you know, 2D games, however you want to call it, and now they're trying to make VR games. Uh, and you can still be asking yourself, well, okay, Pat, you've made games before, but now we're at Oculus Connect. Why do I care what you have to say? Guys, I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay, I'm just gonna be honest with you. None of us have any idea what we're doing. We're not in VR, this is the wild, wild west of game design, right? Uh, I have all of these experiences of making traditional games that I felt prepared me for VR. And so when I went to Minority and they said, hey Pat, we're making a, a VR only game, I thought, cool, I've got experiences, I've got my own mental list of do's and don'ts of best practices, I'm ready for this. I can handle making a VR video game, right? It'll, it'll be awesome and I totally charged in and everything went awful. I was completely wrong about how prepared I was to show up and make a VR game. Right? I messed up lots and lots of things in Time Machine VR, and then I decided that I would come here and tell you about all of my embarrassing failures. So the important thing here, guys, I am not gonna tell you what to do, okay? There's a lot of smarter people here who are gonna tell you what to do, and I'm happy to write down all the things they have to say. I'm here to tell you what not to do. Please do not repeat my mistakes, and hopefully when you leave and make your game, it'll be better than my horrible mistakes. You know, you don't get to repeat the same thing. So the first thing, the first unrule, as I like to call them, I'm gonna talk about targeting. Targeting specifically for shooting mechanics is arguably one of the most refined gameplay mechanics that we have and visual elements that we have in video games today. I mean, we've been making this stuff since Doom. You know, we've figured it out. We've got pretty good shooting mechanics. We've got, uh, I'm gonna show you a quick picture here from uh, uh, Borderlands, right? Uh, I've got an aiming reticle right here. And this thing is not, this should be no surprise to anybody. This is one of the most classic, basic versions of an aiming reticle. It's a crosshair. It indicates a specific point in the center of the screen. It, they spread the crosshair out more when your shots are less accurate, but they move them in when it's more precise. Hey, it's simple. It works. We've seen this a hundred times and no one complains because it's great. Some games are a little bit more realistic. Call of Duty does more of the iron sights, but at the end of the day, it's still the same thing. There's a specific point being indicated on the screen, and that's where your next shot's gonna go. So if you had come to me uh, you know, a year ago and said, hey, Pat, you're gonna totally screw up making an aiming reticle in a video game, I would have had an eyebrow to raise, but I totally did. I totally screwed up making an aiming reticle, and this is how I screwed it up. I did exactly what I was used to seeing. This is a screenshot from uh, Time Machine. Uh, there's a little turtle right there in the middle there, you can see him, and there's a red indicator over him. Now we knew that we were in this cool world of 3D immersion and that we wanted to flex that muscle uh, of having something uh, uh, 3D and immersive in that space. So the, the circles that you're seeing up here, they're kind of faint here, but there's a bunch of concentric circles and we actually have them spread out in depth. So it feels like you're looking down a tube. It's a big holographic aiming scope. And that part feels awesome. It's locked to your head. It shoots wherever you're turning your head. And that part is really cool too. But 
uh, when, when we put the art in, it seemed really cool. I tried it out. Our, our awesome lead artist mocked it up. I had it in the game. I saw a prototype. I was like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. I'm finally aiming at things in 3D. And then I went in the game, and I actually tried to shoot something. And that totally sucked. Take a closer look here. I'm zooming in here at uh, a sc the same screenshot I just showed you. And you'll notice that on each eye, that red circle is not in the same place. And what this means is that you have two targets, one for each eye, and you do not know which one you're going to hit. It became impossible to hit anything. I couldn't shoot. I had an aiming reticle, and I couldn't actually hit a target. It was the saddest, most pathetic failure I've been through. So how did I fix this? How did I fix the problem that now I have an aiming reticle, there's no center of a screen anymore for me to indicate, there's two of them, my eyes can't figure out what I'm shooting? Well. In Time Machine, weirdly, that holographic tube effect that we had going with the concentric circles does an amazing job of alleviating the need to have a specific point indicated on the screen for you to hit. Your brain is really good at, at spatial awareness, at calculating lines and trajectories in three-dimensional space. I mean, you know, I can't throw a baseball for crap anymore, but I know the idea of doing it, and this relies on the same principle. So what we found was we just needed to get rid of the really specific indicator in the middle. We've actually widened it out a little bit. You can't see it too great there because the, the light colors. We also reduced the amount of contrast that the indicator had on the screen to make it less of a visual distraction. And now we've got this holographic tube you're looking down, and you can shoot things. And it works. It works really, really well by broadening uh, and, and loosening how pre precise we were about indicating where a shot goes. Now, this isn't going to work for everybody. If you're making a game that is like you know, Call of Duty in VR, you're going to probably need to find a better solution than that, but I'm going to warn everybody right now, having a fixed, uh, a fixed sort of iron sight style targeting reticle is not going to work. Your eyes unfocus, and you get one in each eye, and it sucks. So do something more like that. Don't do things that suck like I did. This, this, one, is, this one is fun talking about controls, because uh, we use in Time Machine a controller. And uh, I'm going to walk you through an experience that I think a lot of people here will share in. Uh, it really happened to me. Take you to the long, long ago of the year 2009. I had just bought a next-gen console. Uh, mine, in my case, was an Xbox 360. And I played on it a whole bunch, as any nerd does when he buys a new console. And I played on my controller a whole bunch. And then I went to work. I was, in fact, a game designer at the time. And uh, at work, somebody handed me a PlayStation 3 controller to test out a prototype on. And now I'd memorized my Xbox controller, but the buttons, you know, are in different places. The X button isn't in the normal spot, uh, normal spot uh, uh, when you get a different controller. And so I did what everyone does. Everyone in this room, if you've held a controller, you've done this. I looked down. I looked down to look at the controller to see where the buttons were because I was confused. Now, hardcore guys are going to lie to you. They're going to tell you that they never do this. We all do this. I still do this from time to time. If something unexpected happens, I look down at the physical controller. And this happened in Time Machine. People got confused. They couldn't remember where a button was. We'd handed them an Xbox One controller. They'd never held one before. Except the problem is when you're playing a game in VR and you go to look down at the controller in Time Machine, you see your feet. Right? You, you don't get to see a controller. You got a thing stuck to your head. So this was actually a really big problem because accessibility is something uh, that I value really highly as a game designer. I want as many people as possible to be able to play my game and to be able to enjoy my game. Now, this means hardcore guys. This means I want my mom to play Time Machine. It means I want my kid to play Time Machine. I want them to at least be able to you know, use the controller. So how do we solve this problem? This one is a really tricky one because it's a physical reality moment of using a controller in virtual reality. You have a thing stuck to your head. How do we do it? Well, in Time Machine right now, we show you diagrams everywhere. There are diagrams constantly. And honestly, we do these little 2D flat diagrams floating in the game world. And I still think they suck. I still don't think they do a good enough job. People get confused about what the trigger button is and where their fingers are supposed to go. We're actually moving towards having a full 3D model of a controller hovering in the world in front of you. And the, our preliminary experimentation shows this does give a really good sense of presence. It lets people know this is the physical object that's in your hands. Diagrams just aren't cutting it anymore. 
all of our traditional ways of showing people what buttons to press on controllers have gotten less effective. So we need to step up in terms of how we teach people the individual buttons even that they need to press on our controllers. HUDs, heads up displays, are a super tricky thing already. For anybody in this room who's designed a heads up display, you know it's not just as easy as shoving everything into the corner and calling it a day. Right? There's, there's, you need to decide what information goes where. You need to decide what information is worthy of being shown all the time. So lots of tricky things. And we go into VR, this stuff gets even trickier. So I'm going to take you back to that same probe shooting uh, reticle that I showed you, a slightly uh, different version of it. Uh, our probe that we shot in Time Machine has a one second cooldown on it. You can't just rapid fire. You have to shoot it, and you wait a second, and then you can shoot it again. Keeps things kind of manageable. And we wanted to show people that the game wasn't just ignoring that they were pulling the trigger. We wanted to show them that, yes, there's a cooldown. We know that you're pressing the button. We're not doing anything on purpose, I promise. So I did, again, what I'm used to doing. I stuck it in the corner. There's this cool little Google Glass style indicator, uh, Google Glass style projector coming out from the side of the camera. And around it, we put this yellow meter. And it fills up all the way around. And then you can shoot again. And when you've shot, and you, it's on cooldown, it goes small, and it changes color, and it animates. It looks kind of cool. Like, it looked cool. In any other game, this would be absolutely you know, standard, would do the trick, no problem there. But it didn't work, not in VR. I mean, I wouldn't be showing it to you right now if it worked in VR, because that would defeat the purpose of the talk. The thing with designing UI in VR is we don't have corners. There is no corner of the screen. I just tried to shove something into the corner of the screen. There is no corner of the screen when you put on an Oculus Rift. That's not a location that exists. So how does that lead to my UI being so terrible? You need to think about what I'm showing you here, this screenshot, and realize that anything that you're used to being the corner is actually, actually peripheral vision. And there's lots of smart scientist type people who've done studies and research to show how much we pay attention to in our peripheral vision. Spoiler alert, it's not very much. You don't really notice too much of what's going on in your peripheral vision. Out of my experience working in Time Machine, working on an Oculus Rift, people play, pay attention realistically to about that much. Now this is distorted, remember there's lenses that go in front of this picture, but that's about all that somebody is really looking at on any given frame. And you'll notice that my entire indicator is not inside of that circle. So it failed miserably. In fact, one of the things that we got from playtesters, I've never had anything fail this hard. We had playtesters playing the game and say, you know what would be really cool? If you put in an indicator to tell me that there was you know, a cool down on the shots. Like, how can you fail harder than having a UI element in the game and having play testers request that you make that UI element? It's, it was pretty, you know, big blow to my ego as a designer. So how did we fix it? What was the solution for us? Well, I mean, we put it in the circle. That was what we did. It worked really well for us. Now that same meter just rotates around the middle right next to where you're looking. Everybody loves it. Everybody knows it's there. Problem solved for us. But the important lesson learned here is don't put things outside of about that. There are no corners. You need to keep everything right in there. That said, for, for, for uh, other features in the game, less, less uh, 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 things you didn't need to know every second of gameplay, things like mission objectives, stuff like that, uh, we've moved them onto sort of a, uh, a dashboard. It's this, this card that you're seeing on the screen here. It's always present whenever the player has a mission objective. They can look at it. It's in a physical space on the pod that they're in. It works OK. Sometimes uh, the biggest problem is that people still forget that they can turn their heads and look around in the VR space. So people forget that they can look down and see what the mission objective is. Uh, this is a tricky problem to solve. So far, people, as they play the game more, they get more and more used to it. It's just about training people and getting used to the fact that we can move our heads. I don't have a great answer for you. Remember, I'm telling you what not to do, right? But right now, that seems to be the best solution we have for Time Machine. Continuing right along, I think this is lesson number four out of my five that I've got here, uh, Unrules Learning Rate. So playing games in VR really changes something about how players learn to play our games. And that requires that we as designers step up our game and change how we're teaching them. We can't just, you know, round peg square hole this anymore. 
So this is a really, really rough, you can tell I'm an artist, final art. This is really rough uh, level layout of our tutorial level in Time Machine. The player has a spawn point, there's a really narrow kind of hallway they go down, got a big open zone that has some turtles swimming around, it's very nice, and we've got a big toothy mo dinosaur monster, the Pleosaur, who hangs out kind of here, and then eh, it doesn't matter what comes after, I'm not talking about that. So <laughs> we've got this really linear tutorial level where we pace out and teach the player each mechanic individually. We've got, these are the three main mechanics we've got in Time Machine. There's a time freeze. The time freeze is really cool. They learn that in the first corridor. They pull the trigger down, and we've got these cool volcanic jets going, and then you press the time freeze, and they stop moving, and it's really nice, and people like to fiddle around with that a little bit. Then we tell the player throw what's called a tracker, a tracking grenade. It's a little device you toss, screen flashes, and then all of the creatures in the game light up in red. And of course, I didn't adjust the contrast enough for you here, but trust me, there's lots of little red dots of turtles floating around there, which is great, because it's a linear hallway. You can see bright red dots at the end. You go, I wonder what all those bright red dots are, and you, you go chugging along over to them. And then we teach you that probe mechanic. You pull the right trigger, you shoot a probe, you hit these turtles. And this is where things stopped working. And the reason is, again, because I did it the same way that I've always designed video games. I put a button prompt up on screen, and then I had a voiceover telling the player, when you press this button, you're going to shoot a probe. This is really standard stuff. And there's a little bit of a delay, and then we fire up the reticle, and now you can actually do it. Except people didn't. People didn't because the second they saw that prompt on screen, they were hitting that button, and nothing was happening. And in a normal game, in games I've worked on before, you press a button when there's a prompt on screen and nothing happens, you just keep pressing it until the game decides that it's okay, it's your time, you're allowed to do it. But in VR, something changes. I don't know, I don't know if they're more willing to learn like what's going on here, but they press that button and nothing would happen. They'd go, well, I guess that's not the right button, and they'd move on to the next button. they start hitting another button on the controller. Uh, I guess that's not the right button. Nothing happened either. They'd hit all the buttons. Eventually, they would end up back on our tracking probe, and this would end up in our players fruitlessly throwing tracking probes at our turtles and bouncing them off their heads and not actually playing the game the, w the way that we wanted them to play. So players learn fast, way faster than I'm used to seeing them learn. They're impatient, right? They want to learn and they want to learn now. Maybe it's because rage quitting in VR is more difficult. Pulling the headset off is a bit more of an endeavor when you get pissed off at a game. I don't know what the answer is, but they learn in a completely different way. And the worst part is when they pull that trigger and nothing happens, they move on to the next button, they've doubled the damage. Because now, not only have they not learned what that button does, in their mind they failed it away as that button does not do anything. So now I've got to fix all of that. I need to reteach them a button that they thought, you know, a lesson that they thought they'd learn correctly. So how do we fix this in Time Machine? Well, one thing was just I made better flow. I mean, I took the, the tracker that we did and I moved it later on in the flow. I didn't teach them that right away. So now there's no buttons that do anything. They don't get this false positive experiment of throwing a tracker and thinking that's what they're supposed to do. The other thing about moving the tracker to the end there, it helped with, and I'm going to talk about this in the next rule, so don't forget this, hold on to this thought, is uh, Unruh's forced attention. Now, this is, you know, that, that real camera, or that, that virtual camera movement where you're grabbing the player's head and scooching them around, right? I know I can't do that in VR. That makes you sick. We, most people in this room probably know that. It's terrible if you grab the player's view and direct it to a specific point. That is how you get nausea and people, th people throwing up. But how, the question now remains, how do we get players to look at the things that we want them to look at in a game? I'm going right back to that beautiful tutorial do design that I showed you. What we do in Time Machine is after they're busy, after they're done poking all the turtles in the basin, we take that Pleosaurus from further down the path and we tell him to move in and start chopping down some turtles. Because we wanted players to see this amazing moment. Guys, I'm making a video game with dinosaurs. I want them to eat something. It's going to be awesome. That is the moment that so many of us have been sold in VR. A giant toothy beast coming in and no, no, no. Right? Like, I, that's what I wanted the player to see. Except that I had just had them probing turtles, so most of the time what they saw was this. And the Pleosaurus is behind them, chomping down on some more turbs. <laughs> And they're going, this is a very pretty little turtle. I like this turtle very much. That's a bummer. It's a bit less exciting. It's not quite that awesome moment that I was hoping for. And the trick, the, the, the problem here, guys, that I've found, guys and gals, I should be more gender inclusive here, is that 
nothing is 100% in terms of directing the player's attention. Not, not in an ex exploration you know, space. You can't, you can't grab the player's face like you're used to being able to do in a cinematic and show him the cool thing. You can't direct the camera. You can't do those things. You need to do tricks and cute little stuff to try to get them to look where you want them to, but you also need to just accept the fact that not every single player is gonna see all the cool stuff that you want at any given time. That's kind of a bummer. But I think I might have figured out a better way to do it. This is probably the only time I'm gonna tell you what to do instead of what not to do. Which is, you need to tie your gameplay to attention. You need to tie your gameplay mechanics to getting the player to look where you want them to do. So, to get back to where I was going with that, we've got our tracker. It highlights things in red. And you totally can't see what I'm indicating right there. I'm so sorry. But what, you're see what a player would see right there after they throw the tracking grenade last, as the Pleosaurus begins to come into their area, is the red outline around the Pleosaurus entering. And what we found happened for players in this situation is we tell them to throw the tracker grenade. They're like, okay, and they throw it. And then all the turtles around them light up in bright red. They're like, oh, look at all the little red turtles. And they turn their head around to see all the red turtles lit up. And then they see something that isn't a turtle slowly moving in from the depths of the water. And that piqued their interest. And the number of players that got to see that cool chomping moment went way up because we tied a gameplay mechanic to what we wanted the player to actually see. Moving forward in Time Machine, I'm actually hoping to have more mechanics that leverage things like this. More moments where players have to perform an action and the reaction happens right where they're looking, based off of where they're looking. Think, think about you know, a creature's performing a cool animation, I want the player to look at it, so I make a mission objective that's go take a picture of that animation. Guaranteed way that the player is gonna see the cool stuff. That's sort of the direction, but the key here is that you need to tie gameplay to where you want the attention to be. You can't just hope that a player is gonna look where you want. So to sum up all of the things that I've been talking to you guys about, we all have a whole bunch of rules as game designers that we've built in our heads based off of our previous experiences, things we've seen, articles we've read, all that kind of stuff. The problem is that every single one of those rules that you have is up for debate and discussion when it comes to VR. Some of them are gonna work still, some of them are gonna fail miserably. I just showed you a whole bunch of mine that failed miserably. Be ready to fail hard at the fundamentals of game design. I just showed you guys how I failed at designing an aiming reticle. That is the saddest moment of my career, right? That is just, I feel terrible that I failed at that, but we're all gonna fail like that. We're all gonna have things that we're used to being able to succeed at that we can't succeed at anymore when it comes to VR. We need to rewrite those rules. And as a wise man once said, sucking at something is the first step to becoming sort of good at something. So. Okay, guys, I sucked at designing games in VR. Maybe now I'm sort of good at VR. And I have one last thing I want you guys to take away, a little piece of homework, uh, if you will. And uh, you know, I'm not gonna check it later. I'm sorry, you can submit it to me on Twitter if you want. Which is, I want you to go, I want you to fail a whole bunch. I want you to learn from it, and I want you to write some new rules for game design in VR, and then please send them to me so that I can stop screwing up Time Machine. Thanks for your time. Woo!